All right, awesome. Welcome to this Friday's Resolve Riffs. Today we've got uh, Richard Latterman as co-host and um, none other than Dr. Pippa Malmgren for our guest today. And um, I'm sure we're going to explore a, a broad cross-section of uh, geopolitics, uh, techno-optimism, uh, different new ventures that, that Pippa's working on. And um, so before we get started, I want to, uh, first of all, say cheers to all and um, thanks for joining cheers. us. <laughs> and I also want to remind everybody that this is um, explicitly for entertainment purposes only and um, before taking any action in live <laughs> markets with your hard earned money, uh, I would seek the advice of financial professionals. So with that said, um, Adam, that was really good delivery of the uh, compliance uh, disclosures. Well, you know me, I'm I'm always the the <laughs> compliance puppet master, really, right? So it's <laughs> um, good. <laughs> so Pippa, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, oh, I already getting comments on my beard. I shaved my beard, so I was wondering if I was going to get. Oh. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> uh, that's 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 the consensus. I got to grow it back. Um, so. Uh, Richard, I think you were the the most enthusiastic to to get started on this today. So why don't you lead us off with um, the conversation themes? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, I think before we begin, I would definitely want to get uh, Pippa's introduction by herself and uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're currently doing. And uh, don't leave out any of the colorful stuff uh, in your role as uh, presidential advisor and, and maybe even mention your dad there if you wouldn't mind. Okay, well, actually, we can start with my dad, uh, who was uh, the chief trade negotiator for the United States under four presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. So we just, I grew up in Washington and never left. And uh, he taught me an incredible amount about geopolitics and the world economy. So I've been kind of in this subject since a child, since being a child. But uh, I've lived all over the world and I've been very privileged to serve as an advisor to a number of leaders of governments, not just the President of the United States, although I did that during a very, very interesting period in geopolitics. It's when we had 9-11 and I was in charge of a terrorism risk to the economy on the National Economic Council after that event. Uh, but I've taken a really strong interest in broad geopolitics ever since that was all about the US and Japan. These days, it's more about the U.S. and China. And of course, Russia has been a huge issue all along. There's nothing like growing up in ground zero during uh, the era of mutual assured destruction to make you focused on geopolitics. Uh, and then I wrote a book in uh, 2015 called Geopolitics for Investors for the CFA. And it's so interesting that, you know, at that time, people were like, who cares? Geopolitics, like, is that going to influence the portfolio? And today, we still have people being totally surprised that geopolitics can move prices around. So I was really delighted when you guys asked about doing this podcast, because I think it's a super important subject. You know, I, I, I told Richard I was going to let him him lead off, but <laughs> I, have, I have two things I wanted to um, explore. First of all, are there any... Um, highlights or really memorable dinner table conversations that you recall from your childhood? I mean, so many interesting things happened in that era with your dad oh, um, yeah. front and center. And I can just imagine how that must have infused dinner table conversations. Did anything, does anything stand out? Yeah, I'll tell you just one quick story. So um, in a 19, call it 70. 71, 72, um, Nixon asked Kissinger to go to China, uh, but he asked my dad to go to Russia. And so there was this huge opening up of the dialogue between all of the geopolitical opponents, the communist world. And so my dad had one extraordinary event happen during a trip to Moscow, which was he was asked to have dinner by the head of Goss Plan. And Goss Plan was the whole economic program for Russia. Like every single thing that happened in that economy was controlled by basically this organization and the guy running it. So my dad's like, sure, like of course you're gonna have head dinner with the head of Goss Plan. And what he ended up saying to my dad, he literally said, so 
what's your assessment of the Russian economy? And my dad's like, uh, well, I would defer to your sir. Like, you know, you, you're running the Russian economy. He says, how can a smart guy like you be so stupid? And my dad's like, holy moly. Like, you know, as is a diplomatic incident. And the guy <laughs> says, no, think about it. In, in a communist environment, everyone lies to me. Like, I know that I'm sending them only a certain amount of stuff to make steel, but they'll tell me they made five times as much as that in steel. So I know it's not true. So the only way I can find out what's going on in my economy is asking you. So you tell me the American assessment of my economy so I get a grip of what's going on. And, you know, this is so interesting. And I think even to this day, when you talk to your politics, the minute people start throwing numbers around, actually, do they believe their own numbers? This is often the, the case that they don't. That's and it a might really be the point. case. Yeah, it, it might be the case that this is uh, representative of the current uh, Chinese yeah. uh, take because it, it, it's often uh, commented that it's very hard to believe the economic numbers that come out of China and uh, someone within the Chinese thought bubble might have to lean on someone outside to uh, to get a better grasp of what's going on. Yeah, you know, the famous joke for years in China has been when you talk to government officials and you, and they say, would you like to know what our uh, GDP numbers are going to be next year? Because it's right here in the drawer. <laughs> 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 you know, having said that, by the way, you know, having worked in the U.S. government, um, we have our own methodology for torturing the data until it fits the outcome that we like. Right. So this is universal. It's it's not exclusively for certain kinds of countries. Um, one of the interesting things about the resurgence of, of importance of geopolitics over the last few years, in my observation, is just how often markets have gotten the big picture wrong, like like directionally wrong, right? Directionally wrong on Trump, directionally wrong on Brexit. There's just there's just so many different situations where where just by by virtue of, of observing market positioning and the reaction after events, markets have just seemed less able to be able to discern even the direction of likely out uh, outcomes, let alone the, the amplitude of the of the impulses from those outcomes. Do you have any thoughts on what might be um, driving some of that excess uncertainty? I do. I do. Uh, I'll put it really simply um, for those who are Star Trek fans. Some people speak Federation and some people speak Klingon. So people in government speak Federation and people in financial markets speak Klingon. And my like core competence in the markets over the years is I happen to speak both languages. So they don't understand each other. And why? Because the market guys, the traders, they're like, surely they would never put the U.S.-China relationship in jeopardy because that would be so obviously devastating to the economy. It would be so shooting themselves in their own foot. I mean, that's not even an option to think that way. Whereas people in government, are, they don't understand the economics always. They understand the geopolitics of it. So they'll get harder and harder and harder line and then be surprised that there are economic consequences to it. So the first thing is to, for people in financial markets, I always liken it to like when you go to the, when you go to the theater, right? right? And you think you're sitting in the front row because you're the most important person in the room, right? Because you're the financial markets. But actually, in the political world, the financial market people are way up at the back, in the back row, the last seat in the auditorium, because they're like, they're not that important. What's more important is where is Congress, where are the politicians, where is the electorate, where is public sentiment. And so this misunderstanding of whose way of thinking has the priority is at the core of why traders and market people always misstep on geopolitics. So that's that's my theory anyway. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder maybe Pippa, if you could give us a little bit of your view from a 30 foot uh, bird's eye view of what's going on currently in the global stage in the context, I guess, of US, China and more broadly of uh, uh, European countries and within the context of the pandemic as well. How do you, how do you see that balance of power currently shifting? 
Oh, so there's a lot to say on this. Um, first of all, I'll start with the most shocking thing. Um, and and I'm kind of known in the markets as fundamentally an optimist. I like almost always see the upside to things. Um, and I, I'm actually optimistic about where we're going right now. But I would say, in one sense, we kind of are already in World War Three. We are in the midst of uh, what they call sub-threshold conflict. So it's just below the level that requires official responses, but it's serious enough that everyone in the military knows that we're nose to nose with the Russians, we're nose to nose with the Chinese. Um, there are actual physical incidents occurring in various parts of the world every day, um, but they're just below the threshold that everyone knows would make it public information. So we have this weird situation where the general public thinks everything's fine. I mean, you have some noisy exchanges of words now and again, but fundamentally we're not at war. Whereas in the military, you have the sense of we're definitely at war. It's just being conducted in a way the public is unaware of. And I think that's actually a rather dangerous situation. And, and it means you're on the border of the kind of conflict that could flare up very suddenly with seemingly no warning. Although if you're watching this, you should be able to see it coming from a mile off. So that's one thing. And second then is it's just multipolar. It's happening, um, not just the US and China, but also the US and Russia, but it's also happening in remote locations. So the South China Sea, where there's nobody to witness except for the people actually involved. Or, for example, the skirmishes that keep happening between China and India, which are all up in very remote parts of the Himalayas. And again, very important from their perspective, but not visible to the press. Same with Scandinavia, where we see lots of kind of nose to nose you know, submarines, fighter jets between NATO and Russia, the US and Russia, they're all flying within a coat of paint of each other. So it feels to the participants like we're really on the edge. But the public is like, what? There was a there was a near miss somewhere over Finland? Like, and is that relevant? Like, what, what does that mean? Is that even worth having a conversation about? So then let me add finally then the pandemic and what the pandemic has, the pandemic's done a lot of things, but maybe more than anything, it's made it much harder to make sense of reality. And sense making has actually become like a, a, a branch of philosophy now uh, that is, I think, becoming the most important branch of philosophy because people can't make sense of what is going on in the world. And they're realizing that the seemingly trusted sources of information, like, for example, academic journals or government authorities on um, on pandemics or, um, you know, virologists, actually, maybe you can't completely trust uh, what's said. And so the flip flopping of positions further undermines the confidence in authority generally. And when you undermine confidence in authority, you begin to also give oxygen to geopolitics. So there's a lot going on. Feeding my biases there uh, quite a bit. I, I would imagine Adams as well. I'm going to try to keep this uh, in, in some orderly uh, fashion yeah. just so that we can have a, a, a coherent chain of thought. So how would you place what's going on internally in the U.S., the, the political polarization, the 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 absence of any centrism, so to speak, and, and, and how politics has become so uh, uh, divisive in the U.S. How, how, what importance would you give that in this broader context of the apparent decline of U.S. prominence in the globe? Yeah, so I have argued for a long time. In fact, uh, since I wrote my book Signals um, in 2016, that I... Uh, this is a universal phenomenon. It's not just in the United States, but everyone thinks it's local, right? So everyone thinks Brexit was special specific to the UK. It had nothing to do with anybody else. They think the polarization is special specific to the US and you go through every nation, they're all experiencing this same phenomena. So the question is what's causing it? And we can make a list, but one of the things um, 
is something called um, the knowledge doubling curve, which was a term invented by Buckminster Fuller, the engineer who created the geodesic dome and was a, a great visionary. And he noticed that the volume of information that we have to process as humans is doubling on a very fast scale. So from the year 1900, it was doubling every quarter of a century to 2020, when by his calculation, now confirmed by IBM, it's doubling every 12 hours. So when, I mean, literally, think about that, right? It's just mind blowing. So what happens is you can't keep up with the content anymore. And you have, but we've all had that feeling, I can't read fast enough, there's too much coming at me. So what you start to do is say, well, I won't read the thing, I'll just ask who gave it to me. So if I'm, uh, if I'm on the left and CNN gave it to me, then it must be true. If I'm on the right and Fox gave it to me, then it must be true. Because, and this is what makes you, Marshall McLuhan predicted back in the 60s that this would happen, it would make us more tribal because you can't discern and it's too hard to make sense of each thing because you're not expert enough. So you just start moving into to tribes. And I think this tribal element is universal. And that's the bigger issue. It's not just in the United States. It's in every country we're splitting into these cohesive units that are more tribal in nature. What role does the um, social media apparatus play in and, and, the, and the profit motive of the social media apparatus, which is obviously founded on dopamine, um, you know, a, a, amplification, right? Where you, you want to trigger strong emotions and the strongest emotions are hate, frustration, these types of things. Um, so to what extent is social media driving us into smaller and smile, smaller tribal groups where the Venn diagram of the overlap of the information gets further and further apart with almost no intersection? How, how, what role is that playing and, and how do we walk, how do we walk that back? Do you think? Yeah, well, I do think it is playing a significant role in intensifying this issue. It's part of that speed phenomena again. Uh, and you're right, it's all about the money you make from the dopamine hits. That's the key. Uh, so you guys saw the, um, uh, the social dilemma where you know all these uh, coders are like, wait a minute, I didn't mean to create something that was so bad for human beings. I was trying to optimize, but I'm, I've changed my mind. And Maybe not the coders, but they did hire Danny Kahneman with the explicit <laughs> glow of trying to game the, uh, right, the, the amygdala or uh, That's whatever. That's right, yeah. Literally, how do we hijack the part of the human brain that doesn't have any choice but to do um, binary decision making and to quickly lean into the defensive, the fearful. Uh, and so, yeah, naturally this infects everything. Um, and it's something, it's so pervasive and profound. So yeah, how do we walk it back? Well, I think the most, the two most interesting philosophers of our time uh, are a guy called Daniel Schmachtenberger, which of course, a great name for a philosopher. <laughs> Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, and another one called John Berbeke, uh, who's a professor in Canada. Um, the two of them are doing work on this question of sense making. How do we make sense of the world when there's so much information, when the nature of the problems is so huge? They're not even problems anymore, they're meta problems. Like it's, it's at a completely different level. Uh, and they're trying each in their own way to answer this question of how do we disconnect the humans from the dopamine response function long enough for them to become educated about what is actually the issue and what are actually the facts and what are new progressive ways of solving problems. And so uh, in short, one of the things you always have to do is bring people together and frankly, engage in a certain amount of forgiveness. And I do think that probably the single word answer to your question, what has to happen in order to have less conflict, less likely of the subthreshold conflict turning into something bigger, is um, a dialogue that ultimately is underpinned by forgiveness. And it's the hardest thing to do, but it's exactly what happened in the American Civil Rights Movement. It's exactly what happened when Gorbachev and Reagan 
met in person, there's an element of I forgive you for all the misunderstandings. Can we just have a beer and have a chat? And, and I don't see enough of that happening in politics in any part of the world. Kind of so like a truth and reconciliation program that you've seen in yeah. post-apartheid South Africa. That's the totally. It's the same thing. Like as an example, people ask me, you know, will it remain so contentious in, in American politics? Well, you know, when my dad was in government, the head of the Republican Party and the head of the Democratic Party were literally best friends. They had dinner every Friday night. They had a illegal poker game. They drank bourbon together and they solved problems around that Friday night round of cards. These days, you literally are prohibited by law from having more than three people in a room discussing a live political issue unless there is a lawyer present, which means nobody's having dinner parties, nobody's playing poker together, nobody's drinking together. Um, you know, not that I'm saying drinking is so good for you, but you know what I mean? Like nobody's hey. getting together in a, there you go. Nobody's getting together in a chilled out kind of way saying, hey, let's sort this out. Like, let's find a way forward. In fact, they, there's no place, there's no space for that conversation anymore. So how are you going to get there if they can't even go have a drink together and, and have a quiet off the record conversation? It, it's it's, it's sort of profound. taken the, the the human element out of every discussion, negotiation, diplomatic extension, right? Like, um, But when you forget that the person on the other side of the table is a human, we all share that dimension. How can we work together to further the, the human the humanitarian objective, right? That gets lost when everything is overly formalized, recorded, um, you know, everyone's worried about liability and signaling, et cetera, right? One of the things that, that we talk about a lot internally is this idea of a leadership vacuum um, yeah. in, in the West, right? Used to always, certainly for the last several decades, be filled by um, the US and some of the greatest um, successes of U.S. leadership came from um, the ability of leadership to, to galvanize the population behind a larger mission, right? So think of the Manhattan Project, the space race, some, some grand mission. Maybe there's an element of, of competition, but it's, you know, obviously in... in the Manhattan Project, I don't know whether you qualify it as healthy competition. Certainly yeah. I'd call the space race maybe a little bit more a healthy competition. But there's but there's an element of a grand vision and a leader emerges to, you know, bring the people together behind this mission. And I, I do you see anything being discussed in in the halls in Washington, in Belgium, that might stand out as a potential big idea that that the Western world can get behind and from which leadership might emerge? This is such an important question. And, and I don't know if you guys know, but my last two books have been on this question of leadership. Uh, and it's been fascinating writing on that, especially because there's so few females that write on this subject. It's a it's a very male dominated area. And, and as a result, the paradigm tends to be um, kind of the, uh, dare I say, it's a little bit the Jesus Christ model, which is there's one person who knows the truth, and we just have to figure out who that is, and then we follow them. But actually, the invention, of, frankly, of the, of the iPhone, which is not that old, has radically transformed the distribution of power in the world economy. Uh, and so in, where we used to talk about the leader and then everyone would follow them, now power is distributed in such a way that the thing about leadership is that it's not about the leader anymore, it's about the ship. It's about how to get the team, whether that's the constituents or the employees or whatever, the group to work at their best. And so the job of the leader is not to top down, tell everybody else what to do. It is to bottom up, bring through the best characteristics of the collective. And so one reason we're seeing a deterioration of the quality of leadership is the old kind of leadership won't work in a, in a mobile phone environment where power is distributed. 
And second, we're not recognizing that actually lots of people are exercising leadership but not at the level of call it the president or the CEO. Instead, you see the rise of individuals who stand for something. Um, and you know, they're, they're all controversial in nature. Um, I can give you two off the top of my head, both in sports, um, Kaepernick and the, and the bended knee movement. And in the UK, uh, a very interesting young man called Marcus Rashford, who um, basically, stood up and said to the government, you must pay for children's meals, even though they're home because of the pandemic and forced the government to buckle. You know, one young guy who wasn't even from a policy background, he's an athlete. So I actually think we're seeing the rise of personal and personality led leaders. Now, some of them are really great and doing wonderful things, but other kinds of personality led leaders take us in a dark direction. Uh, and, you know, we can guess it, you know, who, who I might mean by that. But I think this is the key is that we aren't going to get somebody who just stands up to the podium and suddenly we all go, oh, wow, there's the answer. Instead, you have to start thinking the leader actually is you. It's me. It's us. It's, it's all the people day to day. And we make our own leadership decisions and the collective outcome is what defines the leadership context. But I'll just say one more thing, because I know you were hinting at it before about the US leadership position in the world. And I just wanted to say one thing, weird thing about that. And I've lived outside the United States for most of my adult life. What's really fascinating is that when the US is being forthright and aggressive and, and exercising leadership, the whole rest of the world says, get out of our business. What the heck are you doing here? You know, We can sort out our own problems. When the U.S. says, we're done, we're staying home, we're not interested in what's going on outside of our borders, the rest of the world says, wait, come back. Where did the sheriff go? Who are you? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the world has a kind of schizophrenic attitude towards American leadership, to say the least. Yeah, very much so. And uh, even though you sidestep mentioning uh, him, I, I'll mention him how, outright, just because <laughs> of the context of trying to under, understand the further polarization, People like to attribute to Trump cause, right? Whereas I just think he's symptom. Yes. I, I just think he's emblematic yeah. and representative of a broader zeitgeist uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is this large, large polarization. So I, I'm wondering, how do you think about this this idea that even though he's out of power, he continues to be kingmaker mm -hmm. in the GOP? And anybody that wants to have a platform or wants to run for a primary within the GOP to then be eligible to run for a seat in Congress or a, a, a governor's seat has to have his blessing. And so what that does to, to actually prevent us from being able to find middle and common ground, but rather pushes us, pulls us farther to the edges. Yeah, it's, it's look, it's a great question. And I remember when... Um, I started to uh, make the argument that he would, he could be out of out of office, but not out of power. And people were like, no, that can't happen. But it can, and that's exactly what we're seeing. And in fact, the more he's found to be engaging in illegal activities, uh, all that stuff, the more it increases his core fan base, because his core fan base is all about challenging the authority, or rather even the centralized authority of government. You know, in a sense, he kind of uh, is the, uh, he's the personification right now of decentralization, of pushing power back to the local level, to um, individuals. And so it's a bigger gripe about you know, where does power reside? And it comes back again to that mobile phone analogy because that has dispersed power to such an extent. And Washington is perceived by by a lot of the country to be wielding power um, not well or in a manner that's not in keeping with everybody's best interest. There are those who feel Washington is just downright corrupt. Um, and there's a case to be made for that. You know, you can make that case. Others who just take an old fashioned conservative view that they just want, you know, government to stop at your door and leave you alone. 
Uh, anyway, the point is, it's the ideology rather than the person that's really uh, at issue. And I think that that's a bigger argument in the United States. And there'll be different people who personify that argument. But the fact is, it's the argument that needs to be had and resolved. And, uh, and we just have to get through that and, and, and figure out reconciliation on that basis. So where do you think that leaves us coming into um, the next election cycle? So uh, let me step back a little bit. I think what we're seeing in the U.S. right now is um, a very positive um, change in, again, the distribution of power in the country. So uh, and it's for many reasons. And it was prior to COVID. But I think COVID's accelerated it. So we're seeing tertiary cities become very, very important. Big sources of economic activity, much greater sources of power. And, and I'm thinking of places like Austin, Nashville, uh, Santa Fe, uh, Chicago. It's no longer just California and the East Coast that dominate the core of decision making for the country. And I actually think that's a healthy thing. And we're seeing tremendous competitiveness in the United States, which again is strange because everyone's like, no, the US lost its competitiveness. And I'm like, well, actually it got it back because China now isn't competitive anymore the way it was. And in fact, the US, if you want to do manufacturing, if you want to do innovation, really the US is the epicenter of all that. I personally think Austin is the, the global center of of innovation and creation in the world economy today for a whole bunch of reasons. So, so that's changing the demographics of the country, right? So uh, the country's becoming more purple. It used to be either red or blue. It's actually becoming more purple, right? Texas is becoming a purple state, right? You got all these Californians and New Yorkers fleeing the, the coastline partly because regulation became onerous, taxes became onerous, like a whole bunch of reasons. But then they bring their values with them. So it's kind of the, the Texans are upset because they've got all these California people coming in, creating a more liberal environment. But fundamentally, it's a mixing up of values and attitudes and experiences that actually tends to make the country successful. So I, I kind of think the country is becoming more purple, even though it feels like the red and the blue are till, still punching at each other. And so it may resolve itself through this reintegration. And by the way, that's not only in terms of geography, it's also in terms of race and immigration. And I think as well, the, the huge and powerful and important arguments that are being had about civil rights and uh, societal integration of, of various ethnic communities. This is a thing that should have been resolved decades ago. It's about time that that got sorted out in a way that everybody can get on with their lives. So um, we could argue about what's the right method to get to the solution, but you can't argue about whether that argument needs to be had. Pippa, let me push back a little bit on the purpleness uh, uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, and, and, and this might be my more superficial understanding of, of what's going on, but it, it strikes me as the blue states continue to remain blue or push even into bluer uh, 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 lands, whereas the red states are, are losing some ground and becoming somewhat more purple and perhaps the, the major urban centers are becoming blue and then everything else around it still votes for the GOP, the more rural areas. So yeah. a, a skeptic uh, on the Republican side would say, no, we're actually losing ground, uh, notwithstanding the fact that most of the legislative bodies within the states remain under GOP control. But when it comes to national uh, politics, it strikes me as the GOP is losing ground. So. Well, how would you respond to that? Well, look, the demographics of politics are so interesting. And, and I'm going to say something that's been true for decades and decades and decades, and it's, it's not really changed. And that is that rural America tends to be conservative. Urban America tends to be liberal. And power has shifted from Washington 
to the cities and to the governors. So I would say the most powerful people in politics in America today are the mayors and the governors, not the president. And so what's happening at that level is actually a lot of movement. Uh, and that's partly because we're seeing regeneration of, of a lot of urban city centers. Um, you know, look at Detroit. You'll often hear people say, well, Detroit's a basket case. And you're like, have you looked at Detroit? Detroit's been on fire. Like it's a completely happening place. It's a huge revival of the music industry, manufacturing, um, a high end uh, hotels going in, uh, communities being uh, regenerated and reintegrated. So I actually think, you know, and as that happens, you start to find more conservatism because there's more to protect. Uh, and that's why, again, one very interesting kind of sub issue is in the African American community, the rise of Republicans. And, you know, most people are like, no, if you're black, you should be Democrat, which I always thought was absurd. Like what, you know, what, if you're white, you should be, you know, like it's crazy, but, but you know, the argument that I'm, that you hear and you have a lot of African-Americans saying, well, actually, I lean conservative on law, uh, rule of law, on um, all these things. Property so rights and stuff. Property yeah. rights, yeah. And my ability to get ahead in my career. Law enforcement, right? You, you didn't see the defund the police movement coming from inside uh, African-American urban landscapes. You saw it coming from other places. So, you know, look, politics is complex and interesting, but for markets, the really, really important question is, um, can, can politics progress in such a way that permits value to be created? You may not like the politics, like people, a lot of people didn't like Donald Trump as president. And I think a big mistake that traders, investors make is they confuse their emotional position with their trading position and internationally as well. A lot of people were like, well, I don't like Donald Trump, therefore the US economy can't possibly get better. Or I don't like Donald Trump, therefore the stock market can't go up. But actually you cannot like Donald Trump and the stock market goes up. So disassociating and, and treating as independent, your emotional response from what's actually happening to prices is really, really important. Pippa, so much of your, your comments on um, on leadership, on the types of themes that might galvanize or motivate the public um, or engage the public, um, your your comments on um, how the the political demographics have changed speak to sort of decentralization, right? And I'm and I'm harkening back to. I remember reading a lot of Jane Jacobs and um, her discussion of decentralization and, um, and and the evolution of healthy cities. And one of the risks that she highlighted was um, that as you move down the um, the political scale from federal to you know all the way down to sort of uh, state level or municipal, the <laughs> Even small at, at the federal level, it requires very large actors to perpetrate um, regulatory capture. And as you move down to the state level and the municipal level, then smaller and smaller um, incumbents have sufficient power to um, prevent competition or, you know, lobby for laws that preserve the status quo and prevent economic dynamism. How, how do you sort of see that trade off? I don't think it's linear anymore. Uh, and you can have very small groups of people who are highly, highly empowered, uh, both in Washington and out in the regions. Uh, and I think this is partly what we're exploring now is who has the power to do what? Like, where does the power lie to get stuff done and in what way? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's so easy anymore. Um, and you can't also count on, you can't make assumptions anymore about how somebody thinks about an issue, right? It used to be, I, like even at the beginning of this pandemic, if you'd asked most people, 
Will young people object to being vaccinated? They would have said, of course they won't. They're intelligent, they're educated. They're blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out young people are objecting to being vaccinated. It's super interesting. It's the, the Gen Zers who are like, I don't know, this has happened really fast. I don't know if I trust a vaccine that was developed this quickly. I, I have a teenager who's in this space. So I hear the, from the teenagers, it's global as well. It's not just in one part of the world. So that's the thing, when you talk about the, the movement of power, the decentralization of power, it's also about a change in what can you assume? And I think that's part of a bigger issue, which is that we no longer have a reliable global commons. Yes. And, and by that, what I mean is a, a common set of beliefs. You can go, oh yeah, of course, we all agree. Yeah, no, we don't all agree on really basic stuff, which is back to what John Verbeke and, and um, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger are working on is like even the words that we use where we don't agree on what is the meaning of the word, uh, it's getting that granular. So you kind of can't assume anything. Yeah, these thought bubbles uh, seem to be really keeping us from finding a common narrative, common truths, and, 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 and just arriving at something that can be uh, uh, thought of as quote unquote truth that we could perhaps rally behind in a common project. So I want to pull on that thread and maybe take us a couple steps back. Given these thought bubbles and, and, and given this exponential age that we find ourselves in with the, the, the doubling of information every 12 hours, I, I, I've always been curious about some of the generate multi-generational frameworks that are used to make sense of global uh, politics and geopolitics and, and whether it's Neil House fourth turning or mm -hmm. uh, Dalio's recent essays on, on, on the rise and fall of, uh, of empires. Yeah. And I wonder if those have ceased to be or maybe even adding the Thucydides trap, that, 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 that Thucydides notion of the, the clash of a rising and a decadent uh, uh, power. If those uh, frameworks are still valid in the context of the current uh, exponential age environment? Oh, I love this question. Uh, and I think it's a, a, the crucial question. So, you know, throughout human history, you have two very powerful conflicting forces. You have chaos on the one side and you have cosmos on the other. Cosmos is always meant to be a kind of a, a world, a description of what makes the world what it is. And so how do you get from chaos to cosmos? You basically impose order on things through a thought process. So like in economics, we like to use math, right? We throw math over the world economy. We quantify everything and we say, right, that we make decisions based on the quantifiable reality that is the economy. So economies that are growing fastest are doing best. But now everybody goes, wait a minute, my economy is growing fast. My longevity is, long, is greater. My, my uh, standard of living is higher, but I'm unhappy. Like suddenly we start to go, well, this Bhutanese idea of a happiness index where actually you're not growing fast, your standard of living is low, but everybody's happy. Right, so that's a different way of interpreting reality, but you're using math as the kind of construct for sorting out the chaos. Storytelling is another way. And that goes to your previous point, which is really important is that common narrative. And I think one of the things making it hard for people is they want a common narrative when in fact, we're in what I've been calling a quantum recovery which is multiple conflicting narratives, all of which are true at the same time. Uh, and in that sense, it's a lot like what happened in the 1920s in the aftermath of not just World War I, but the Spanish flu pandemic. And some people were just so happy to be alive after all that, and they partied and they you know, built a future. And some people were completely devastated by those events and got thrown off the world economy like a hamster being thrown from a wheel and could never find their way back. You know, so one group we know through the novel, The Great Gatsby, because they were drinking champagne and having a great life. And one novel is The Grapes of Wrath, where a whole generation 
you know, literally were displaced from the land and ended up in the dust bowls uh, with literally no life to be had. So they were both true at the same time. This is similar. And I think it's hard for people to process multiple simultaneous competing realities. But actually, that's life. We often have that situation. So yeah, which one are you going to invest in? And, and my answer is, whatever you've decided is true will be what you find. So if you're an optimist like me, I see examples of the 1920s and things going beautifully uh, everywhere I look. But if I were a pessimist, I could find many examples of economic devastation of people who were uh, lost and won't find their way back. So basically what you look for, just like in physics, you influence like Schrodinger's cat, your observation of reality causes the reality that you will experience. Yeah, I like that answer. Uh, it is, I guess the answer to most questions, if you're trying to go down a proper rabbit hole of, of real explanation is it's complicated. It depends. There's nuance around the answer. So the, the, there, there are many competing uh, uh, truths uh, to that. So, so, but just going back to the original question, do you think those frameworks are still uh, somewhat yeah. valid in, in in understanding the the uh, what we're witnessing right now with the apparent decline of the U.S. and the apparent rise of China? There, there, there I've heard. I think it was a uh, Louis Vincent Gav uh, mm -hmm. talking about uh, you know the, the the prominence of China and you know and and and, and perhaps not really downplaying somewhat the what's happening in Hong Kong and, and, and Taiwan. But then you can see the the opposite side of that argument being, well, anybody who can leave China and find a better mm -hmm. life in the US in, in, or, or, or other Western countries will try to do that. And some anecdotal information of uh, graduate students asking for their professors in their universities to help them find a job here so they can stay. So. Yeah. How do you square that uh, uh, the, those two competing models of, of, of uh, political rule? Yeah, it's a great question. So the first thing I think is super important is that um, how many countries do we have in the world? It's like 170 something at this point. And the fact is that many of them are succeeding at the same time. So we don't have to choose. Is it the U.S. or China? Both can succeed using their own business model and, and their own political model, and they're very, very different. Uh, and actually, the world is a better place when both of them are succeeding. Uh, we had the same issue. I was an advisor to the government during the preparation for Brexit, and it was all very either or. And I'm like, well, why can't Britain succeed and the EU succeed at the same time? There's no reason this can't happen. And people were like, whoa, that's a mind blowing thought. Like, really? It, surely it has to be either or. It's like in a divorce, right? Oh, wh who's going to do better? You know, one or the other. Yeah, what if they're both okay and they, they make their way into a new life? So um, I don't think we have to choose, but I do think that the models that are being chosen for these places are all very different. And I don't buy into the assumption that China is the future and the U.S. has already lost its place the world economy. In fact, what I see is absolutely the opposite of that, that the direction of travel in China is is inimical, is inimical to innovation. Um, things like their social credit system, uh, which I think it's very hard to say to people, I want you to, in fact, I require you to um, agree to the party line and behave according to the rules. Oh, but when you go to work, I want you to be really, really innovative. You know, it's just, that's not how humans are. They, they become innovative by pushing boundaries and testing the rules and breaking things. And, and the US has much more that kind of ethos of, and you know, the, the famous line, you know, I think it was break, break things faster. That gives you a lot of innovation and an acceptance of mistakes that you don't find in, in the Chinese uh, culture and ethos. So I, 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 yes, they have a large number of people. Yes, the standard of living is rising, 
But does that mean that China is the future and that displaces the US? No, not at all. Um, so I don't know, maybe I think, yes, you're, the answer to your question is the old frameworks are not answering the question very well. We do need new ones. And, and in fact, my next book that I'm working on is very much about coming up with a new framework for reorienting ourselves so that it's not so binary, uh, so that you can make your way forward without um, being stuck in the, again, it's like, like I said, you know, throw math over the economy, it's like a veil and it creates a certain structure or you throw a story over the economy, it creates a certain structure. One of the stories we had in America is that, you know, it's worth working as hard as you can to own your own home. Yeah, but that's not true anymore. You know, you could work really, really hard and never be able to own your own home because of what's happened to prices and and inflation is back. And so we have to come up with both new stories and new ways of projecting order onto chaos. Yeah, no, I like that. Uh, but I think lingering for a second here on the U.S.-China situation and maybe going back to one of your first points in the conversation, which is we are actually in the midst of a war. It just hasn't been fully hot yet, but it, it might at any second. How do you see the potential for the, the two sides maybe tripping into a war, kind of like what happened in World War I, where you know that concept of guns of August, everybody miscalculated who would do what and mobilization led into a conflict that couldn't be stopped anymore. Yeah. Uh, I'm reminded of, and we talked about this in a previous episode, uh, I think it was uh, Ian Bremmer uh, was describing the situation now with TSMC in Taiwan and the U.S. Ha having them build a factory, a huge factory uh, in Arizona, and then telling the Taiwanese, no, you actually can't export some of these chips to mainland China. And he was equating that to being akin to some foreign power, possibly Russia, back in the 60s, uh, trying to uh, approach Lockheed Martin in the U.S., mm -hmm. which was as strategically important to the U.S. back then. So how do you see that risk of them tripping, each, uh, tripping themselves into a war or stumbling into a war uh, by, by miscalculating how the other side will react to one of these uh, uh, strategic moves? So uh, my dad always jokingly calls this the whoops factor. And uh, it's a real phenomena, you know, in the military space, like, uh, whoops, you know, an event happens and suddenly you cross the line that you didn't mean to cross. And, um, and suddenly, yeah, you're in trouble. So I'd say it's high and we're seeing examples of it all the time. Look at the Huawei issue where uh, it was the arrest of, um, one of the owners of Hawaii, uh, the daughter of the owner, and boom, you suddenly, you know, this isn't just uh, uh, a limited issue. You're like in a massive diplomatic incident that totally changes the landscape of the dialogue between these two superpowers. Um, I think and collateral not, damage for Canada. Sorry to interrupt, but just collateral yeah. damage for Canada. Canada has two diplomats that are still arrested in China because they, which is which is kind of crazy. If you yeah 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 exactly, and suddenly everybody's a pawn in a bigger game, and you know big American corporates start sending emails to all their employees saying if you don't actually need to go to China, don't go because you could be detained. You know suddenly the risk of doing business in China isn't that you know you might get a lung infection because the air pollution in Beijing is not good. It is that you might be arrested um, because you're a pawn in a much bigger game. So I think this is exactly what markets should be aware of is the very fragile nature of this balance of power and that a small thing could cause a big slip up. And that's why it concerns me when I see these um, near misses with um, military uh, vehicles, whether that's spy planes or, um, you know, fighter jets. Uh, the fact is that you could actually have an incident and then it's harder to talk it down once, once stuff like that has started to happen. And that's why I say I think we're closer 
to being in all, you know, in a sense, we are in World War III because uh, we have these, these localized conflicts in remote places, but with superpowers behind them, right? So in a hot sense- Hot proxy wars. Hot proxy um, wars are a real thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I almost want to think about um, the some of the moves made to protect U.S. tech from the Chinese or Taiwanese tech from the Chinese as sort of economic or commercial brinkmanship. Um, and what what we're starting to see, like I, I, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen comments out of indirect channels in China um, making very direct nuclear threats on Japan if they were to intervene on behalf of Taiwan. Do you see this as a as a um, like an official escalation or is China testing the waters here a little bit? Like, wh what do you think the purpose of that is? Wh what are they signaling? Yeah, and then it's always dangerous to talk about China's position on on any issue in geopolitics in the same way that you can you can say, well, what's Washington's position on nuclear weapons? And the answer is they're about like 11 different positions, you know, with different right, sure. people and it's never unified. Uh, and in China, do you occasionally get somebody who's very senior in the political establishment who says something that's where, you know, everybody working for that guy is going, oh my God, I can't believe he actually just said that, right? We, you see that too. Uh, and so it's really tricky interpreting what any one person says. What's important is that the Chinese definitely feel under threat, that the U.S. is leading an effort to deprive them of the single most valuable piece of equipment for growing any economy, which is the, the modern semiconductor chip. And the fact is we do have a global shortage and the cost of building a new semiconductor plant is, is billions. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary how expensive it is. You know, we're, we can't regain that ground, even the United States. So um, this is a finite resource that now everybody's fighting over. And let me add another layer of complexity to this because we used to talk about war games and geopolitics, and that meant, you know, tanks, troops, um, personnel, yeah, now it means children's games like TikTok, Minecraft. They've literally been named as frontline phenomena of the new geopolitical warfare. Why? Well, because it's the digitization of geopolitics. As we create for every person, every place, everything, a digital twin, as we absorb all this data, like every time any of us plays Minecraft, and it's gathering information about your emotional reaction, about, uh, and you know, if these games are equipped with listening equipment in the house, all the conversations, what's happening in the household, you know, all this information is incredibly valuable for understanding the psyche of the of the nation. Frankly, for any individual, I mean, I'll give you an example. When I was working in the in the British government and we were doing the Brexit negotiations, everybody was like, we have to lock all the documents in the building and nobody's allowed to take any documents home. And I said, OK, but what about when you get home? And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, so you got home and you start talking. You say, well, I've got to go down because the prime minister is calling an emergency meeting. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, but everyone now has all these chips in their rubbish bin, their trash can, the refrigerator, the children's game. If someone wanted to listen in on a UK cabinet minister, they're like 20 things in the house that are IOT enabled that totally permit you to do that. So, and they were like, oh, we hadn't really thought of that. And I'm like, this is the new Cold War. It's happening in the digital space. So this is why... Um, you know, when we talk about where's the new geopolitics, even militaries haven't fully understood this new digital battle space that's maybe in your kitchen rather than on the border of Estonia or something. How does this that's play really into what we're seeing with um, the Chinese government stepping in very aggressively in some of the consumer tech yeah. um, and education industries in in china and seemingly deciding that 
innovation and investment has kind of run its course and is now counterproductive in those domains and making the explicit um, pivot towards more strategically productive or valuable industries like like semiconductors. I mean, is this a reflection of China recognizing that A, some of these technologies can be used against them and their citizens and, and are currently being used counterproductively in those ways and also seeing an opportunity to redeploy resources in more strategic sectors? Sure. You know, at the end of the day, the Chinese political leadership have never given up on the idea of command and control. They, you know, they, they never actually became capitalist. The people became capitalist and they all went off. And, you know, when, when you know, uh, this idea of, you know, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches a mouse. And the, that was permission for the public to go make money. But it doesn't mean that the political leadership ever bought into the idea that uh, capitalism should be allowed to just run, you know, free. It's always been a command control will give you permission as long as it suits the leadership. And then when a lot of people started getting very, very rich in China and the distribution of wealth started to become so wide and uh, that started to cause social pressure, suddenly they, you know, basically the, the people running the biggest companies disappear. And when they reappear, they give a press conference saying, I decided to give away 99% of my company. Yeah, where did they give it? Uh, back to the government. You know, it's this, it's a kind of, uh, it's an um, expropriation uh, approach. But, you know, no one would phrase it that way, but that's one way of thinking about it. Um, and by the way, just to be clear, I don't want to be too heavy handed just on the Chinese because in the West, we are also using this digital data, digital um, information landscape in a very similar way. It's just we privatize the function. So we're okay with Amazon and um, uh, Facebook and um, Google all having the social credit system that's applied to each one of us, uh, that somehow that's better. But is it, or is it really the same thing? So again, as we digitize reality, digitize politics and geopolitics, the landscape of that is something so novel, uh, something, to me, it's literally the wild west of our generation. It's this lawless place where we have not established what are the rules, what are the ethics, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, and so that's a universal phenomena. So, so I don't want to be too tough on the Chinese because we've got exactly the same phenomena just occurring in a slightly different way. No, I mean, I agree. Yeah. It's, it's um, I mean, I would liken social media for the most part nowadays, um, like the new cocaine trade, right? I mean, it, it triggers exactly the same mm. neurotransmitters. <laughs> and so now you've got um, you know, sanctioned commercial entities with that are omnipresent, that have algorithms that are highly effective and getting more effective by the day and by the bit at hacking human cognitive function and decision making. And they're allowed to operate largely outside of any sort of regulatory apparatus. And we are performing an uncontrolled experiment on mm -hmm. democracy and um, the capitalist system. And so it certainly will be interesting to see how that plays out. Michael Harrison is in the um, the comments and he, and he asked a really interesting question. I'd love to pose it to you. Do you okay. see perestroika in China? No, that's a very interesting question. There was a window when I thought that was happening. Um, and that ended, uh, I'll tell you when I thought that ended. I have to look up the exact year, but it's when they suddenly arrested the head of the security services. In other words, the kind of head of the equivalent of the CIA and the NSA. KGB or whatever. Uh, and the, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember all of a sudden when he was arrested and charged, I was like, oh, then all the efforts leaning in the direction of perestroika for China, that just ended. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll look it up while we're talking and see if I can find the date. It was is that Bo Xilai or is that the? Yeah, it was Bo Xilai. Yeah. 
and that was the beginning of a big reversal and uh, a realization that the old guards that wanted to go back to, again, more command control, less personal freedom, um, they were regaining the upper hand. So as we look at the, the different um, proxy wars and wars that are happening in um, unfamiliar domains, right? In the information yeah. domain, in the commercial domain, where do you see um, some of the major potential flashpoints, right? That, that market participants might want to keep an eye on or explicitly hedge as yeah. they're making forecasts and, and positioning capital. Well, I'll tell you the ones that I'm paying attention to, uh, but they're they're unconventional. So one of them is um, Scandinavia, the Baltics, uh, basically uh, skirmishes that happen between the Russians and NATO or the Russians and the West off of Norway um, in the Baltic Sea, uh, Belarus, this whole kind of part of the world that we haven't really thought about much since, you know, the last world war is actually just rampant with submarines chasing each other around. A um, lot of quote research vessels that are really military vessels. Um, the, there are lots of internet cables up in that part of the world and the Russians are always trying to dredge them up so they break the cable. Um, I, that's one part of the world is the, the Baltic Scandinavia. One part is the Arctic. And I think there's a huge geopolitical race going on right now for the Arctic. The Chinese have developed the fastest icebreakers in the world. They can now get from Dalian to Rotterdam, which is uh, the northern Belt and Road, um, even though it's a shipping lane. Uh, so it's part of the belt, as it were. Um, they've they've able to get there. I can't remember last time I looked. It was something like 28 days. But Rotterdam has become like the coolest, most happening city in Western Europe because so much money has gone into it as the final port of the Chinese Belt and Road strategy. And um, that is important for a whole bunch of reasons because the Russians are basically going, wait, wait, this is ours. We control this. And then the Chinese just pass them at such speed. They're like, did I hear someone say something? You know, <laughs> you literally can't defend it. And this part of the world has a lot of advantages from a geopolitical point of view. One, huge source of protein. And everyone says, oh, I'm not fishing in the Arctic. I'm not trawling for protein in the Arctic. But mm, I kind of think they are. So there's a huge environmental issue associated with that as well. But also... We live in a world where uh, if, I'm, if IBM is right and information is doubling every 12 hours and add to that supercomputers and quantum computers, right? Which is the new geopolitical space race. That's where all the new defense spending is going is basically code breaking. Who has the fastest computers that can break the code faster, whether it's a nuclear code or a genetic code or a bank code, like any kind of code. So to do all that, you need cold, right? It, otherwise, you got to literally air condition all these computers. So where do you start to put data spaces? The Arctic. And so we're seeing a lot of, you know, underground caves, um, deep underground military bases, all being constructed by the Russians, by the Americans, by, because you're putting computer systems in there. And that'll be the new backbone of the the data side of geopolitics. The, the backbone of it will be in the very cold places. Some of those being put into the deep underwater spaces, open ocean. Again, because it's cold and that's what you need for fast and, and vast data processing. The other places I'm watching, um, I keep an eye on what happens between India and China. I think that's a very volatile, tricky border. Uh, and we see lots of incidents occurring. Um, so far, the two sides manage it, but that, that has the capacity to flare into something bigger. Every once in a while, it starts to, as the Chinese move into places like, um, again, Bhutan, Nepal. And why is the Himalayas important? It's important because 
the Chinese are now focused on diverting the water supply because they want to turn the west of China into California, which can only be done if you irrigate it. And they need to grow more food. So that's the solution. But it also means potentially depriving 60, 80 million people of their water supply. So are we going to see a skirmish or a clash over water from the Himalayas? Answer, probably. This is this is a right place for that kind of event. Um, if I have to pick uh, a physical space as well, it's um, uh, underwater and huge investments going into submarines because they're invisible. They're wonderful because you can do all kinds of things and the public never knows about it. So China's real focus for their, their blue water Navy hasn't been the aircraft carriers that get so much attention, but rather the submarine capability. And then that's like the old Cold War. You know, it's like World War One and World War Two. There's all the submarine activity that you never hear about, but but it's happening. So those are some of the things that I'm watching. Um, anything to do with critical infrastructure that suddenly doesn't work, uh, the colonial pipeline. Um, you know, there are those who say, of course, that's not geopolitics. There, no one would, no nation would get involved in that. But I know not geopolitics. It, I think that you know, again, we're in a data space where digital control over remote resources and assets is an everyday thing. You know, huge divisions of the American government, the Russian government, the Chinese government devoted to that. And so you shouldn't be too surprised to see sometimes infrastructure just suddenly stops working for a while. And lingering on this point for a second regarding the uh, war making capabilities of the exponential age, uh, you've touched upon the colonial pipeline, cyber warfare, but we've recently witnessed the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict on Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, we saw drones and just technological warfare with a lot of unmanned resources being able to deliver these uh, David versus Goliath kind of victories to underdogs. How do you see this modern uh, warfare landscape developing in the coming years, especially in the context of a possible uh, hot conflict between China and some of its neighbors and potentially the mm -hmm. US. Well, again, technological innovation is happening in weapon systems just as much as anything else. And so the miniaturization of weapons and uh, their, their cost is coming down. And so, you know, stuff like those drones that have, they made a material difference in that case, like uh, uh, the kind of drones that normally a nation or non-state actors could never have afforded. And now they're reasonably within reach. You can afford them and you can use them and they're accurate and, and they work. So uh, that's a permanent trend in the world economy. Weapon systems are always becoming smaller and more capable and less expensive. So it's very hard to, that, that never reverses. And um, so we'll just see more and more of that. Um, and But you're right. It means you can never afford to just get lazy on that front, right? Otherwise, you end up like the, the Polish, um, you know, cavalry in World War I, you know, on horseback. And they- Against they're machine really, guns. And against machine guns, yeah. This is a permanent, state of affairs that you have to keep innovating in order to maintain balance of power and heaven forbid that anybody actually has to use these sorts of weapons. And that's a really one really super interesting question, especially for this audience on the podcast is, you know, how we all feel about um, robots in warfare. And is it a good thing if you have robots fighting robots and you get the humans out of the way? Or is it a bad thing if you start deferring to robotics to make autonomous decisions? weapons? Autonomous weapons. Yeah. This is a really deep philosophical question that every one of us faces now. And most people have no idea how to answer it, but it's a it's coming at us quickly. Yeah. And you're 100%. you're doing quite a bit of you know, venture investing and and research in the robotic space. Do you have any opinions on that, that that might help to 
you know, help people who haven't given it a lot of thought or don't have a lot of knowledge in the space to come to their own conclusions on that? Yeah. Um, so I would say we are going to see the uh, robots being used much more in the conduct of warfare and, you know, as you say, hot proxy conflicts. The question is, do you empower an autonomous system to have a go at a human? Or do you empower an autonomous system to have a go at another autonomous system? And uh, they're two very different things. Uh, I don't know. How do you I, differentiate between the humans on your side and the humans on their side? Yeah, also. well, Or civilians been, versus, you know, military. Yeah. And that's already been a problem, right? The, the friendly fire has been an issue in every single war. In fact, you might get less friendly fire if it's more robotics and autonomy. Uh, so this is why some people are actually leaning in this direction. But it's it's a it's literally a, a historic moment because also the the capacity of robotics to engage in autonomous decision making is increasing exponentially every day. Uh, so anyway, I I personally think we should try and avoid having to have the conflict to begin with, uh, and that requires human nous, human diplomacy. Uh, that's not a numbers game that can be done by an algorithm. I think that has to be done by, by humans. Uh, we're back to, you know, forgiveness and engagement and those things again. Going back to the uh, political, geopolitical 3D chess uh, between China, the U.S. and Russia, uh, it's interesting that the U.S., uh, I think it was Biden uh, very recently giving his blessing for the pipeline, the gas pipeline coming out of Russia and benefiting particularly Germany, but more of Europe in general. So kind of conflicting objectives and, and all these different incentives in place and definitely seeing this this sort of pivot that Russia and now and China are now very much aligned as much as possible, Arctic notwithstanding, against U.S. Uh, hegemony. So, how to how to galvanize, how to rally U, uh, Western U.S. and Western uh, Europe interests more generally against this sort of looming threat, given that the, the, these commercial and energy needs uh, interests are, are conflicting to this degree. Yeah. Well, so look. Pipeline geopolitics have been around for a very, very long time, right? This is not a new issue. But because of the German position that um, nuclear is not acceptable under any circumstances, it's created a vulnerability that they're totally dependent on, um, if they want to have any heat in the winter, they're totally dependent on Russia supplying. And the Russians kind of like that position and they like playing with the temperature dial in February, you know, and turn that down and suddenly you hear some screaming and, you know. Especially it, in the Ukraine. Indeed. Uh, and I, only recently I was in a conversation with someone from the defense establishment who, you know, gave a very cogent explanation that the whole purpose of this strategy is um, to get the West to walk away from Ukraine altogether to allow Russia to retake that territory and control it. Um, and, you know, again, this sounds like power politics of the last century to even talk in these terms. But yeah, these are, these are the strategic possibilities on the table. Um, and in Western Europe, there's another phenomena, which is all the new gas fields that have been found in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think there's gonna be a punch up at some point over who owns what, because it's so valuable and there's such a need for it. And all of the countries are saying, hey, some of that must be mine. But technically it's mainly Cyprus that owns it. It's mainly Israel that has the licenses to develop it. And it's mainly Russia that would be most injured if that alternative source of energy were developed. Um, so that's another place I kind of keep my eye on things and, you know, fire on an offshore rig in the Mediterranean at 3 a.m. kind of 
who does that serve? You know, <laughs> like there are certain parties that might not want those rigs fully operational. Uh, and I do think you could get some conflict between different countries like Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, all saying, hey, this is mine. No, 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 it's mine. No, it's mine. Um, so how about yeah. Saudi Arabia in that context? Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia definitely doesn't want uh, their their uh, prominence in the energy world uh, undermined in any way. Well, actually, you, you say that and I hear you, but there's something much bigger going on in Saudi which is uh, like like the big oil companies like BP and Shell, they've decided that they want to go for net zero, that actually being uh, so dependent on um, you know carbon emissions generating energy is a dangerous place. And that's why uh, one place to watch with some care uh, is this new geographical location they call Neom. And Neom is a city state which is vast that they are building and it is intended to not only be a zero carbon city but to be a place where they develop sources of income for saudi that are not dependent on oil and so that community will be um uh the, all the traditional rules about gender will not apply uh it will be um highly um science research oriented, you know, the highways they've already committed are going to be built out of these um, solar panels that actually charge electric cars as you drive on them. So all of the power comes from the sun blasting down on the solar panels and you charge your car just by driving. So Tesla, Tesla might be interested in that technology. Yeah, 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 they yeah. had a plan about this, but I don't, I don't think it ever went through. Yeah. So, and in this way, Saudi is really at the forefront of innovation in moving away from oil. And so it's going to be interesting to see whether they can accomplish this task. It's very ambitious. So they committed like a quarter trillion dollars to this project over the next 25 years or something. Like it's just an it's, astronomical it's sum. And this amazing centrally planned Silicon Valley type um but, you know, nice coastal city looking to cultivate the reefs and everything like it. Yes. It does sound like a really interesting project. It does. It does. So, this is MBS's vision, I guess, from from, from pivoting. Yeah. And, and, and you do raise a good point. So do you see Saudi Arabia perhaps extricating itself from this quagmire that is the Middle East, even though they, they, they do still sort of use their weight in OPEC? and trying to keep the Iranians down, this whole Shiite mm -hmm. Sunni uh, millennial tussle uh, there. But it, it's hard to imagine that Saudi Arabia would, would step back completely from that uh, from that arena and, and, and the weight that they pull in. I, 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 I totally see where you're going with this uh, point about the pivot. And, and it is definitely something that given the trend, given the global trend and the zeitgeist for, for green and for, for uh, climate change, it behooves them to, to sort of plan for the future. But for the next few years, it's unlikely that they would take this this complete step back. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I think they are trying to take that step back from oil as fast as they can. Um, and by the way, the, Nor Nor the Norwegians are doing exactly the same thing. Um, and weirdly, you know, the price for fish is now higher per barrel uh, than the price of oil. And traditionally, the Norwegians made more money out of fish than oil. And now they're back in that position again. And they're like, well, let's focus our attention on generating revenue from nature and keeping nature in good shape because we make as much or more as we do from oil. So Saudis are not alone in, in this reassessment of what's the right way forward. Saudis, of course, in this... Um, very awkward position because the world is holding them accountable for what happened with Khashoggi. Um, and I don't know if you guys have been following the headlines recently. I think it's super interesting to follow the Pegasus story. And so the Pegasus story is basically is Israeli uh, built mobile phone software that allows you to track someone's movements without their knowing it. Uh, and apparently Pegasus was used to track several m heads of state in Western Europe, including the prime minister of France. 
Uh, and it was apparently used in tracking Khashoggi and knowing what his movements were. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's being used for tracking um, journalists who are trying to tell an honest story. So there's a huge controversy now about this digital tool being used in geopolitics. So I think part of the reason Saudis are building Neom is to offset the their sort of brand image and create a new one for, for the nation. But we're back to what we started talking about earlier, which is if you're trying to impose you know order on chaos, you, you can do it through math and numbers, but you can also do it through story. And so the story of Saudi is now going to be one of highly innovative, uh, very progressive, giving more freedoms to women and minorities, uh, introducing things that are genuinely good for the environment. And that's, that's how they will shift. They will take control of the narrative in this way. Yeah, and Love just it. to be clear, the Pegasus uh, 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 software, which gives you the ability to hack phones kind of outright, that's a private enterprise, right? It's, it's not an Israeli government tool. Right. It's, it's, it's more of a, it's, it's a private company that uh, does that. And, and it, this has been sort of at the forefront of a lot of espionage and several developments in the in this geopolitical arena completely and and let's just be clear the the hacking of mobile phones is not very hard these days there are loads of you know apps just on the app store that you can load up somebody else's phone in such a way that you can you know get their messages and you know see what their activities are i mean it's just not that hard so this is part of that new digital world where your digital twin is revealing all kinds of information about yourself that you don't realize you're revealing. So we're coming up on an hour and a half. I want to make sure we, we, okay. we touch on a couple of concrete um, things to, to leave people with. And I also want to make sure we touch on your book and what it's about and, and when you expect it to be published and when we can all, all look forward to reading it. So from, the, from an investment standpoint, do you have any strong opinions on um, sectors or regions that investors might want to focus on opportunistically and any particular um, themes or types of trades that investors might want to consider um, as strategic hedges? Yeah, totally. So first thing is, We've had a record amount of money into the world economy from virtually every government around the world. And that money is definitely looking for a home. And you have a record number of entrepreneurs who've either been displaced from their old job or who see opportunities and want to create something new. And usually the free money and the people who could put it to work will find each other sooner or later. So I actually see this as the beginning of a period of immense innovation and probably on a par with the industrial revolution except faster uh bigger uh and so when it comes to the stock market people are like i can't believe it's so high how can it be so high the world economy is falling apart and i'm like it's just gonna go higher it's gonna keep going higher because it's there's got to be some place for the money to go and there is a place for it to go innovation is real and it's happening and people are coming up with better business models all the time also, we are getting inflation. And you guys probably know I'm always a little bit of an inflationista. And I argued back in 2015 that we were losing all of the things that were holding inflation down. And so we would expect it to start bubbling up. It might take time, but it will come. And here we are. I think that we are definitely seeing inflation. When you see that, and of course, most people don't remember inflation, but those of us who are old enough to remember it we know what happens, which is that equities go up in the beginning because Procter & Gamble has the pricing power to outrun inflation. So you, that's what you buy. Property can outrun inflation. Surprise, surprise, property prices are going up much faster than anyone expected. Bonds, not so attractive, although you have to buy a certain amount because governments require you to hold you know, liquid investments, but you're not buying it on an inflation view. You're buying it because you're required by the regulators. So if inflation is in play, I expect asset prices to rise much more dramatically. 
So I see some really significant upside that most people are not prepared for that. They're all preparing for the you know, next great depression. And I think actually, I don't see that happening. I see the opposite. But like I said, if you wanna find the next great depression, there are plenty of examples that you can find and then you can invest in that side of it. But I think the, the, the side of the trade that'll be more fruitful and less expected and therefore easier to get into is that the upside is much higher than we thought. So let me add to that as well, government defense spending is accelerating and what is it going on? It's going on computers, supercomputers, quantum computers, data processing, that's the new space race. And I think the spinoffs from that for the private sector will be as large or larger and more impactful than the spinoffs from the NASA program in the 60s and the early 70s. So that's all investable as well. Um, and again, the decentralization of power means more and more entrepreneurs are coming online. They're able to build. There's a new phenomena called GPT-3. Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically the ability to, to code without needing to be a coder, to, to, be, to code in plain English. Now it's early days, but this is the direction of travel. And it means that you're gonna democratize the access to the capacity to build APIs, to build apps to build software in general software yeah. yeah and i think that is very promising as well so i'm definitely you know in the, on the optimistic side that we're going to see some extraordinary upside performance in the world in this coming few years and how do you, you want to you hedge some of the some, no okay you know let's let's go let's do that first richard go yeah, no, I was just going to ask uh, if you uh, care to mention some of the ventures that you're involved with in the technological space. I've heard you mention them in, uh, in, in previous podcasts, so I'd be curious to hear. Yeah, so uh, I've got a company that's actually in the drone space. Uh, we're not manufacturing, but we're advising uh, big corporations on their acquisition strategy. Because you know it, it's really interesting how technology is always both overhyped and underutilized at the same time, and drones are definitely in that category. But the companies are now beginning to properly register that having command and control of data from an aerial perspective is incredibly valuable, especially if you're running remote assets. And I personally think that the value of a remote asset, whether that's a mining site in South America or a farm in Africa, it goes up dramatically when you know that you can look at it whenever you want and measure it whenever you want. This is not like the old days where you had to rely on someone on the ground telling you and they were like, oh yeah, everything's fine, but they were down at the bar. Yeah, now you can really <laughs> see what is the actual situation right now. and. So in that sense, drones are literally like prosthetics. They're an extension of your sensory capability. Uh, and that's the right way to think about those robotic tools rather than as a thing that just delivers a beer across a golf course, you know? But uh, I, I've got another project that I'm working on that I'm very excited about, which I can't announce yet, but it's gonna be um, in the engine space. And again, the, the amount of innovation going on- the Cold fusion? Are we talking cold fusion? No, no, not cold fusion. No, but that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, anyway, and then and I've, I've got a um, uh, another thing I haven't properly announced yet, but it's a startup that I'm doing that has to do with bringing together people who are very brilliant and at the cutting edge of their field and allowing them to come together and work with companies uh, to innovate in terms of diversity of thinking. And um, I think that's a huge space because the old model of, like the LinkedIn model is you live a life where you have one job and then you sequentially have another job and then you have sequentially another job and you have this thing called a career path. And this has been blown away. And what people now have is a portfolio of different risk ventures that they're all pursuing at the same time and uh, they all, people who are really switched on have a range of different interests. And more and more companies are saying, I don't want to hire all these people full time. I don't want them on my staff, but I do want to bring them together, solve a problem, disperse, come together again with a new problem. And that's what we'll be doing. Well, I, I hate to, to, to shift gears uh, again after such a, a lively and optimistic mm -hmm. um, take but 
for, for those managers who do want to manage risk, what are the highest leverage risk management trades in your opinion um, at the moment? Uh, geo geopolitical and macroeconomic? Well, you know, I always find this question hard because also not everyone starts in the same place. So like I'm often asked because of my background in foreign exchange markets, you know, should I buy dollar yen or should I sell dollar yen? And I'm like, well, where are you starting? If you're already long the thing or are you short the thing or do you have any experience at all in this thing? Um, and because you can make money on both sides of these trades. It's all no, about so, so assume assume on average people sort of own a U.S. centric or global sort of 60, 40 type portfolio. Right. Like yeah. what are what are yeah. some of the, the highest level of strategic hedges at the moment, do you think? Well, I don't think so much in terms of hedges. What I'm thinking more is you can't invest in terms of sectors anymore. You have to invest in terms of there's some people in every sector who are radically reinventing the business models. And those are the folks you want to be with. They are totally redefining what a business is all about. And, and I see a lot of that happening in every single sector. So that's not sector specific. Um, in terms of hedges, I'm kind of with Warren Buffett, and this is going to sound funny because it's not how people think, but the best hedge in the world is investing in yourself. It is investing in your own skill set, your own knowledge base, your own network, your own genuine understanding of a subject matter. And I think often what happens in markets is we think, well, I went to college or finished graduate school and now I'm in this field and now it's just about trading. Yeah, but no, we, it's lifelong learning. You've got to go back and start to study what are the new instruments available? How do they work? You know, um, for example, in finance, how many people are really understanding what's happening in DeFi, in um, NFTs, in crypto punk, uh, in digital currency. By the way, we didn't even talk about digital currency, but you know, sovereign digital is also a new frontier in geopolitics. And the Chinese, the Americans, the Europeans, the British, they're all gonna introduce sovereign digital, which brings a whole new element to geopolitics because you can control large territory if they, you can get them to use your money and gather data from all of them as well. So uh, I don't think it's capitalism taken to yeah, a whole new level, whole new level, whole new level. So I think if you don't get those things, if you're like, well, I don't really get this DeFi thing, I don't really get crypto. Well, then you have to go get it. You have to invest in the knowledge and study it because these things are not going away and you're not going to have a chance to catch up later. So that's that's the hedge is invest in your own knowledge base. Love it. Point taken. Never ask an unabashed optimist to, to tell you where, where things can go wrong. <laughs> I think that's Perfect. a great place to end. Yeah, that, that, that was a great uh, uh, point for optimism to leave everyone with. So I like it a lot. Agreed. I was so Pippa, glad. We're going to have to do this again. You. Yeah. Hold on. I, I want to pip up. What's your book about and when, when is it being released? And, uh, and... I don't have a date yet. I don't have a date yet, but the tentative title is signals and sense making. And it's all about, you know, how do we see the signals that cast a little light on the future and how do we make sense of things enough to be able to deploy capital? So I will let you know, but I'm working on it now. Love yeah, it. Where can people find you? We'll, yeah. Yeah, I'm on Twitter under at Dr. Pippa M because nobody can spell Malmgren. Uh, and, uh, and I'm on LinkedIn. I put stuff up on LinkedIn. And I'm always open to having a conversation about, you know, what people find interesting in the market. So come say hi. Well, we're extremely grateful for the 90 plus minutes that you spent with us today. Um, there's been some amazing comments and enthusiasm in the in the mm -hmm. chat. Um, everybody's found it really, really valuable and interesting. So thank you so much for such positive energy and incredible breadth of, of knowledge and insight. This has been a really interesting and a useful conversation. So hopefully yeah, you have yeah. a chance to do it again. Exceeded expectations. Thank Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys are great. Have a great thank weekend. You. You All too. Right. You. Have a great weekend. See you later. Bye, guys. Bye. Keep the music. This episode is brought to you by Resolve Asset Management Inc. Separately Managed Accounts, available for U.S. and Canadian investors. 
While diversification is often discussed, it is important that it actually be delivered. Through the suite of Resolve Global mandates offered at varying risk levels, we aim to strike the balance between global diversification, appropriate risk balance, and directional alpha. Our portfolios are designed to safeguard and profit across many economic regimes, including periods of negative growth shocks or unexpected rising inflation, periods in which, in our view, the traditional 60-40 portfolios may fail to deliver adequate returns for investors. Resolve to improve your portfolio. Click on the link in the description to reach out to a representative and assess which Resolve mandate is right for you.